Stephen King once said, Life is like a wheel. It always comes around to where you started again. This could also be true for our embedded software development lives, right? <laughs> Except that wheel has about a million spokes. Libraries to connect, peripherals to pair, standards to be adhered to, driver OS and firmware updates to contend with, and somewhere all in that mess, I'm back to where I started. Rethinking the whole thing. Hmm. Wouldn't a drag and drop configuration system be helpful right about now? Yes. Yes, it would be. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jock Talk. Sometimes it's easy to get mired in the minutia of embedded design. Luckily, Brett Novak from Microchip is here to introduce us to Microchip's MP Lab Harmony 3, an easy solution for code migration that includes a whole host of libraries, application examples, developer tools, and control techniques to get your next design from zero to deployable and nothing flat. And then maybe we can stop working on that reinventing the wheel business. <laughs> and before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about Microchip's MP Lab Harmony 3. Hi, Brett. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, you're welcome, Amelia. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. So, Brett, we've talked about MP Lab several times here on Chalk Talk in the past, but I don't believe we've ever talked about MP Lab Harmony 3 before. So, what's it all about? Okay, so the basis of what we're going to cover today. So, Harmony 3 is the underlying extension to the MP Lab environment. Of course, MP Lab being the microchip software side of things, it's our compiler and our integrated development environment. And it covers our 816 32 bit devices. With the recent acquisition of Atmel and some of the micro semi parts, we now incorporate not only the PIC devices, but also support for AVR and the ARM devices as well. Harmony is a layer and modular library solution. Uh, this includes peripheral libraries, drivers and services, middleware, demos and application examples, as well as what we call MHC, which is the graphical development tool. And this allows customers to go from, basically from zero to a deployable, usable, code developed platform that they can take and put right on either a development board or under their own hardware and really get up and running quite quickly. Harmony 3 is the third iteration of the Harmony platform and what we've done with this version is modularized it as much as we possibly could. Instead of a huge download you can now just go and grab the bits and pieces for the specific components you're looking at as well as the specific application level components you're looking at. Okay, so what does the architecture look like for Harmony 3? We hate to say that it has layers to it. We don't like to say that code is layered, but when we have to put this on a screen, it looks like a layer cake. From the far left, as I said, we have the Harmony configurator. And what this does is this gives a graphical interface to the three major components within the framework architecture. Of course, at the top, we have the application. This is motor control, which we'll get into today. Could be touch, this could be graphics, this could be connectivity, ethernet, USB, things like that. That's the end application. What are we actually developing? Of course, in the middle, we have all the software that makes this stuff work. And this is, this is where we get into the, again, the layer cake. We have the real-time operating systems. We have middleware, which interacts between the application layer and the drivers. And then we have the peripheral libraries, which you'll hear me refer to as plibs. This all resides within the same framework. As I mentioned on the first slide, we've sliced and diced it so you can go and download bits and pieces. If you're building a motor control system and you don't want to use ethernet, you don't need to go and grab an ethernet stack. So again, we've tried to make it as efficient for downloading as we possibly could. Cool. Now you mentioned we talk more about motor control. What does the motor control story look like here? All right, so if we build out this slide, we have the Harmony configurator on the left, and this is sort of the overall big picture of the system. We have our applications, we have our system configurations, and then we have our peripheral libraries. Our peripheral libraries are really what 
the application works with to make the whole system work. In a motor control application on the right, we have the application at the top, we have the motor control abstraction layer, and then we have the system in the PLIBs in the middle. If you were doing networking or touch in the orange box, we'd have either the touch library or the graphics library. So that library is module and configurable. So these can be changed. This is where, as a customer, you would go in and do your own secret sauce. That's where the good stuff happens. The beauty of this is development model. You don't have to go to the peripheral level registers. We've taken all of the hard work out. It's not exactly a layered architecture. I know it kind of looks like a layer cake on paper. It is not layered that way in the actual flow of the software. You do have direct access to the peripherals. So even though you are using a library, you can still go in and change all the peripherals. The code is optimized. We've used the optimization engine within MP LabX. It is also MISRA compliant, and that's MISRA, M-I-S-R-A. That is a safety compiler level. This is MISRA compliant code. We've also done things, especially in the application layer, to make efficient use of the CPU. We don't want the device just sitting there churning away doing nothing. All of the abstraction is done at the hardware peripheral layer, and that's in the motor control function. I go back to the example of networking versus motor control. Unless you do have the two in the same thing, motor control, we have an ADC, a PWM, maybe a quadrature encoder. We generally don't have those in networking. So in the motor control abstraction layer, we've already preset some of those common components. You can certainly add different ones in, but we've done our best due diligence to make sure that we are looking at common components. Okay, so can we dig into the PMSM FOC part of this? Sure, let's get into the fun stuff. The slide that I've got up here, this is, this is sort of the big picture slide, a view of MHC, the Harmony Configurator. And as you can see on the left side, I have what is my motor control pack. So the PMSM FOC, the motor control algorithm, I have the SIMS's pack. I've targeted a, a SAM E70, which is a Cortex device. So this can use the SIMS's library, the device family pack. All I have to do is bring that into my visual environment and Harmony loads all of the peripherals for that device. I can then go in and pick the peripherals that I want to use. Now, you'll see these lines with the little green diamonds and a little yellow diamond. These are drag and drop connections. So you put the system down and you just... ADC connects to ADC, PWM connects to PWM in the PMSM FOC. So this being a fairly generic algorithm for uh, sensorless motor, censored or sensorless motor control. If you double click on that, it brings up what the box on the right is, the configuration options. In here, you can change the position feedback. If you want to do pure sensorless, then you would change the sensor quadrature encoder to a sensorless. Do you want to run in torque control? Do you want to use field weakening? You'll see what we call zero speed maximum torque it will be a part of this. This is a trick that we use for very high instantaneous torque at zero RPM. But again, this shows the overall generic block diagram of the software for a motor control system. We have our AFEC. This is our ADC. On the SAM E70, it's called an analog front end controller. It's just a nomenclature thing. So the ADC, PWM, quadrature decoder. You'll also see X2C scope come up quite a few times. This is a data visualizer that works in real time. This is an additional software package that it, it's free and it supports all of the microchip devices. But this gives a very nice way to do data visualization in real time on hardware. So it's a hardware in the loop visualizer. So Brett, what does this all buy me as an engineer? So when we go into the component level, uh, the goal here is to make things easy. And if we start at the top, we have the PLIB connectivity. Again, we're automatically configuring the PLIBs per the selected algorithms. So I, I mentioned those green diamonds. You don't want a green diamond and a yellow square. Those two things don't connect together. So you, you want the green diamonds to go to the green diamonds. This makes it easy in a couple of different ways. One, you can change 
the hardware, and when I say hardware, the MCU. You can change the MCU and the system will reconfigure the PLIBs. So if you go from, let's say the SAM E70, which is a Cortex M7 to our new PIC32 MK, a MIPS device. They have different core architectures. They have different peripherals, one coming from the Atmel acquisition and one being traditional microchip. They're different. They're different devices inside. We don't want to go and rewrite our basic algorithms. Our application should just run. So what the PLIBs do is the PLIBs make it simple that I say, okay, I want to evaluate the MK. Boom. Basically, just I delete the SAM E70, I put the PIC32 MK in, and it brings up the peripherals that are associated with the application. Again, it makes it easy to change your control techniques. I can also do the same if I've picked the hardware. I can change my motor control algorithm. If I don't want to do a permanent magnet motor, if I want to do a different type of motor, a different type of control, then I just take that control application out and put a different one in. We go even further. You can change the motor. We have a few different motors that we provide as reference or demonstration motors. The Hirsch motor is, is the one that is supported by default. This works with both of our high voltage and low voltage boards. You can also change the, the inverter board. We have the MCLV2, which is what they let me marketing guys types use high voltage boards. They don't let me near those too often. You can take our boards and go in and very easily modify them for your own motor, your own inverter board. And the code is fully functional. It's modular. It's open. We don't hide anything. There's, there's no black box code in here. As I said, it's easy to port back and forth to different devices, and we've optimized everything to be the best system efficiency. So what are the steps for implementation? First thing we need to do is instantiate the project. So we'll, we'll touch on that. I mentioned the PLIBs and the little green diamonds. We'll touch on those. The user interface, the pin configuration. This is important when you go from okay, I've done everything on microchip hardware. Now I want to go and make my own board. Oh no, what pins do I need to use? We've made that easy. Look at some of the code structure, the call, the PSM task. As I mentioned, you'll see in there the Scilab. And then how do we build this thing and program it on a board? Okay, so Brett, I believe that first step was instantiate. Is that right? Right. So the first thing we want to do is instantiate the system. And what this really means is we're going to go and we're going to copy what microchip's already done. The greatest form of flattery is copy something else. What we've done with Harmony 3 is, again, I've, we've sliced and diced it into bite-sized chunks to download. We're also using GitHub rather than just having it on a microchip repository. We are using the GitHub system. Now, these go directly to the motor control. For those of you that don't know what Git E is, GitHub is the US and European, and Git E is the Chinese version. These are all externally hosted now. And basically, what we're going to do is we're just going to open a Harmony 3 project, start the Harmony configurator. And then double click on the PMSM component in the available components. So it's just that simple. And that brings up our algorithm for our motor control. Now you'll see, I don't have any of my device family pack side of things. So any of my PLIBs, I don't have my ADC, my TCC, my QEI. I don't have those in my project yet. So you'll notice on my control algorithm, my connections are red. There's a reason for that. Now. The next thing I do is I'm going to go and I'm going to pull in the family pack for the PLIBs. And this gives me a UART. The UART needs to connect to the ecstasy scope. This is to talk back to the computer. Now notice these are all green. And I didn't do this live, but basically when you put these in, it goes from red to yellow when it has a mate. And then when you connect the dots, it goes to green. It's just that simple. And the dependencies are very easy. So if it's on a left side of the block, it's a dependency. And if it's on the right side of a block, it's a capability. So we have dependencies for the algorithm that have to be met with capabilities from our library. This way you can't miss something. So it makes it kind of easy to visualize it and say, oh, I don't have any red bangs. I'm good to go. And now we get to configure the system, right? Where do we start? Right, so now we've got everything connected. Now we want to start actually talking to some hardware. And what we want to do is we want to go and change the board parameters. Now, this is where 
a customer would want to go in and if you have your own hardware, you would be going and changing things in these boxes to match what your hardware is compatible with. By default, we come up with the low voltage, the MCLV2. We do have support for the MCHV, the high voltage board, but we're just going to focus on the MCLV2. So MCLV2 comes up. This is low voltage, 24 volts, 4 amps, about 5 amps. Bus voltage divider ratio, 0.6. If your board supports 48 volts at 5 amps, then you change it to 24. We have a start-stop switch on the board, a toggle, a direction LED, and a fault LED. PWM configurations, this is also important. This is part of the motor control, the PMSM function block. Right here, I have it set up for a 20K PWM frequency. My PWM phases, so U is on channel 1, V is on channel 2, and W is on channel 3. I have one microsecond of dead time, which is pretty standard. And then I have a PWM fault. This is fault 15. So if I have a PWM fault, it'll automatically trip a flag in the system, shut everything down safely. Now, PWM phases, these come in pairs. We have a high and a low. When it says PWM phase, the U channel, this is PWM pair number one. So this is a high and a low pair. And the dead time is the same for all three pairs, one, two, and three. Some simple other things that we want to configure. I set this up for two shunt phases. I have a 12-bit ADC. I can drop this down if I really wanted to. I could drop it down to eight bits, but I have 12 bits available. I might as well use them all. So my ADC, so the first ADC is ADC zero. So I'm using channels one and two. And then my V phase, so I'm measuring two shunts, U and V. And that's channel number four on the ADC. Potentiometer and the DC bus voltage, these actually share the same ADC input. This allows me to have speed control. So now when we get to the pin manager, you'll see what, I'm, what I mean. These all line up with the pins. We've done the, the software side of things with the microcontroller, but we need to tell the microcontroller what type of motor we're actually spinning. And, and again, this comes into the power stage where, where we use the MCLV as the board you would change the current, uh, some of the phase timings and things like that. Again, the default supported motors in the system are the Hirsch motors. These are available with and without hall sensors, with and without quadrature encoders. They're available in 24 volt, 48 and 400 volt models. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time a customer wants to use their own motor. So, our motors will get you up and started. That It gives you a background into the system, how to tweak and tune things. But what do we really want to change if we're going to drive our own motor? Well, we go into the motor parameters, and we've laid out the majority of the basics. You can still go in and tweak this by hand in the background, but the basic things that we want to go in and configure. What's our motor connection? Well, on this motor, it's a, it's a star, and we might have a delta Y. We need to put the phase resistance, the axis inductance, quadrature axis inductance. These are all things that a, a motor designer is going to be able to get from their motor, from the data sheet for their motor. And this, this is different for every motor that's out there. This is really where you would be changing. You know, motor pole pairs, ours are five pole pairs. Some might be six 10, 12, you know, rated speed, max speed, max motor current, things like that. This is where you change the motor parameters. But rather than going into hundreds of thousands of lines of code, we're giving you a graphical window that I just double click on and it pops up and it says, what do you want to set the inductance of your motor to? What do you want to set the phase resistance to? I don't have to go through and use control F and look for every step where it says, what's my phase resistance? It's very easy. Couple of clicks, bring it up, change it, save it, compile it and done. And next would be the control parameters. Is that true? That's right, Amelia. So again, as part of the simple to use UI configurations, we've set up the control parameters. And these are the parameters where we're actually changing the control loop functions of the motor control. This is the heart of the motor control where we talk about the permanent magnet, the FOC component, or the censored versus sensorless. And again, we've given everything access. This is all point and click and change it right in the system. So sensorless with a PLL estimator. I can go to 
censored with a hall sensor, censored with a quadrature encoder. When I change the sensorless to censored, the system is set up so that it also changes in the background, it changes the pin mux to make sure you can use the pin mux for the quadrature encoder or the hall effect input. So it's doing all of this in the background so you don't have to go in and change everything line by line by line by line by line. You can change out the algorithm in five minutes. It's that quick. Things like open loop. Do I want to run open loop? Do I want field weakening? Do I want a forced alignment at startup? Do I want an alignment lock time? So if the motor doesn't start spinning within two seconds, I throw a fault and I stop so that I don't start burning things up. Again, they give the marketing guy an eval board and he burns things up. So generally not a good thing. They put the protection in there for me. All of these parameters are very easy to change now instead of going in line by line by line of code. That's what we want to make sure that people get is it's, it's graphical. It's, it's easy to use. It's graphical. In addition, we can go in and change the control loop parameters. And these are the things like the phase currents. We can go in and, and modify the phase currents. If we want to have phase currents that have different current levels, we can do this. We can change the PI limits for different speed settings. So all of this is in the system. It's all point and click. It's all drop down boxes, no hunting for lines of code. It's right in there. You can also do an auto calculate with this. If you want to have the system auto calculate your PI loop, click the auto populate button, off it goes. We would also need to configure the pins as well, Brett, right? Right. I mentioned this a couple of times. This is in the MHC window. So we go back into the main window and we go down to tools, down to pin configuration. And again, you'll see other things like the DMA, the clocks, the AFE, that's again, the ADC. What this does is this generates based on the part number. This will generate, now you can see I have pin number 102. The device that I'm targeting is actually, we call it a plug-in module. This uses a 144 pin device. So I have 144 total pins. But what this does is this automatically tells me I've already configured all of these different things. These are the pins that come out. So as a designer, you're looking at this going, okay, my UART's over here. My PWMs are over here. My timers, my timer inputs for my quadrature encoder or my hall effect are over here. But it also shows you what else is available and what pin it's on. So if it's an analog pin, it shows up as a P analog. This is all analog in this section, but it does show, you know, open. Do you want to click? Do you want the pin to be open drain? Do you want it to have a latch on it? So this makes it very easy to figure out what pins you're using and how many pins you're using. Because many times a smaller pin device is less costly than the higher pin devices. So this gives you a really quick snapshot to say, do I really need a 144 pin device? Or is a 100 pin device enough? Or can I even go down to something like a 64 pin device? So what about the generated code for this? Generating code, again, we're still in the MP lab system. Basically all we do is we push the button that says generate code. There's a button right at the top of MP LabX. We generate the code. It will configure all of the source files. It will configure all of your header files and it basically builds an entire project. You generate the code and from there you build the code and you run the code. Couldn't get any easier than that. It really doesn't. I mean, it's, it's build, it's, it's generate it, build it, compile it and run it on the device. And, and the code structure Obviously, we have the configuration files. These are going to be our header files, our .hs. You can see that we have user parameter .h. These are going to be configurations for derived parameters. Then we have the interfaces. We have the actual interrupts. We have the true software library in the control library. And then we have the input and output processing. The final layer in the whole puzzle is the hardware abstraction layer. This is MC underscore hail dot H. You can see that the naming convention that the system uses, it makes sense. Motor control voltage measurement dot C. That's pretty easy to understand. Okay, that's where my voltage control measurement comes from for my motor control function. So I probably need to go there if I've got a problem. We've made it look simple. We've made it as easy to read and go in. As I mentioned earlier, this generates C code. You can go in and hand modify this C code all to your own delight. 
we don't lock it down. You know, you can use it as is, or you can go in and tweak and tune and play with it all that you want to. So the HAL, this is what we call the hardware abstraction layer. This is really what I was mentioning before, where this is what makes it easy to swap in and out different MCU components, as well as different, different software components, different algorithms for the motor control things. It also removes dependencies on peripheral instances for specific hardware on the boards. So Brett, how exactly are we going to execute this code? A couple slides ago, we talked about generating the code and this is quick snapshot of the top couple of lines of the main.c. The reason I have this highlighted is you'll see, this is where we have the call for the FOC tasks, for the PMSM FOC tasks as well as this X2C scope communicate. So it's just a little tidbit that it's that that's where this gets called. You can update main.c through here. You can update any of the headers. Once you're done, it's standard operating procedure within MP Lab X. You build, let it crunch away. And if you have a device plugged in or if you have emulator plugged in, you hit program, it targets your emulator. And it should, if you're better than I am, start executing code right on the board. Usually I have to do this two or three times, but it really is build and then program and hope that the lights on the board turn on and it starts running. I really do appreciate the simplicity of all of this. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so we're, we're getting to the end of the slides here and thanks for keeping your eyes open this whole time. Just a, a couple of quick notes on the 3.5, this is the current version of the PMSM FOC control program. And again, we're adding to these. Next, you'll see a Lunenberger observer. So we are continuing to roll these out. This is the, the first of many. Obviously, PMSM is, is, is fairly universal. It's, it's used quite often. So from an MCU standpoint, this works with our SAM E, V, and S70. These are our Cortex M7s. PIC32 MK, which we call Indy, and PIC32 MK MCM, which we call Brickyard. MCM is our new device. We are rolling out support for the SAM D5X series, which is our M4. So stay tuned. That'll be released somewhere in the December or January timeframe. MCLV2 and the MCHV3. These are the two microchip supported boards. These are our standard boards. They accept the MCU32 as well as the MCU16 plug-in modules. So you can use a DSPIC type device on these boards, an M4, an M7, even an M0, and of course the PIC32 MKs. The motors, our Hirsch motors are supported with this. For positioning feedback, this system supports the sensorless PLL estimator, and we also do have support for the quadrature encoder, startup alignment, Q and D axis, control loops that are implemented right now is the speed loop, the current loop, and open loop. We use open loop with the sensorless application, and this does support field weakening. One thing for rotor position feedback, I, I mentioned it very early on, we will have an update to this package that does also include zero speed max torque. So keep your eyes open for that. It'll be a 3.5.1 or a 3.5.2. So even making the naming convention simple so that we know which got updated when. So where would you suggest going if I need a little bit more help with the motor control part? Again, as I had mentioned very early on, we have the GitHub and the Git E links. These are the primary repositories. You can also get linked to this repository from the microchip site. We have those links on our website as well. This is all online. There's no registration. Just go in and download it and off you go. Okay, so if I'm ready to get started, what are my options? Options are pretty straightforward. As I had mentioned, once you have the software package, then the options for hardware, the MCLV2, the MCHV3, and the SAM E70 and the PIC32 MK plug-in modules, they do support this right out of the gate. The only other download that I recommend is to go and grab X2C Scope. Again, that's the data visualizer. It makes life a little bit easier when you're trying to do the tuning. This has been super cool. So what should my audience take away from today's Chalk Talk? Oh, absolutely, Amelia. And so just in a quick wrap up. So Harmony V3, this really gives us an easy solution for migrating code between different microchip MCU32s. Everybody has their own abstraction layers now. This is a, a software framework and, and we do use it internally. It is supported by multiple business units within the microchip environment. So from MCU32, 
our wireless devices, as well as our MPU devices. And it does support things in addition to just motor control. We touched on that today, but as I mentioned very early on, we've got uh, graphics, we've got touch, we've got networking, we have security, we have all sorts of different operating systems. So there is quite a bit in Harmony and it is updated. As I also mentioned, it is MISRA compliant C code. So it's certified C code. These tools are free. The, the software tools are free. We expect you to just you know go out and download them. As always, please provide feedback to us, good, bad, or indifferent. We try and do our best to have as much flexibility in these software tools. For the actual motor control system, the visual system, this is supported with PIC32MK and the SAM devices right now. We're always adding more device support. And right now, all of the hardware is available and in stock on the Mauser website. So you can go click the buy it now button and be up and running whenever the FedEx man shows up. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Brett. No, I, again, I, I want to thank the group and uh, I'm always here for questions. I'm always here for help. Looking forward to the next topic of conversation. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about Microchips MP Lab Harmony 3. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.